Das Unheimlich, which is also my tattoo. Oh, yeah, that's what we all about, low moral standards. Yeah, exactly. If you do need some moments of trashiness and some moments of nastiness. I had a divine experience uh, yeah. at National Galleries. <laughs> Ugliness and trash are the biggest entertainment in our lives. My only drug is, is being on control, in control of myself. I'm actually sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, try to change my mind. Also, when I criticize something, I'm always looking for, for, for you to bring some, some ideas or some evidence to change. It was very refreshing to go to an exhibition, which was not trying to give me a, you know, a lesson on how my cultural views should be framed by contemporary trends. Say once, once you go Bridgerton, you never go exactly. Back. <laughs> I mean, okay, okay, <laughs> That's amazing. Hello. Hello. Uh, Culture gone bad is back after the Easter break, after the whole Western world had a spiritual enlightenment sessions. Jupe, tell me, uh, what did you get up to over Easter? So over Easter, I uh, I had a very happy escapade, marvelous escapade, in Britain, in Bath, which is probably I, I I don't want to exaggerate because I didn't see much of England except London, but it makes you feel like you're in the most beautiful place in the country when you go there. Everything is so amazingly consistent. Everything is imbibed into in this sort of I call it the yellow bath, this this yellow stone that 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 everything is made of. And there is a beautiful uniformity in the city. The only other city that gave me that sense of uniformity, besides the small Italian medieval, mm -hmm. medieval cities in which you can see that there is great consistency, everything is built around the same time, etc. But the only other place outside of the old Europe uh, that I've experienced, in which I've experienced, this is Jerusalem. Mm. So Jerusalem is probably Israel is one of the most beautiful countries I've been to, but Jerusalem especially has this amazing um, uniformity because everything is built with the same stone, even the new buildings. So there is this great continuity be between the old Jerusalem and the, and the new Jerusalem. And the only thing that you can clearly see from afar when you go to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus spent his last night praying in the Mount of Olives, uh, when you look from there, to the city, the only thing that you can see is the golden shrine, which is this place where uh, allegedly Mohammed flew to the skies after a night walk in the desert. And it's one of the most sacred places also for, also for uh, Muslims besides for Jewish and, and Christians. But back to uh, Bath. So I was in Bath, it's amazing, mostly uh, 18, 19, 18 slash 19th century city. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized that a lot of weird crowds were taking pictures next to my hotel. I was in the Royal Crescent, and next to my hotel, uh, uh, there's these crowds taking pictures. Okay, maybe they were taking pictures because they uh, were trying to keep memories which we can erase. Because you know what we say, yeah. Bath is a British version of Las Vegas. So basically, exactly. whatever happens in Bath, stays in bar uh, maybe in the past but now uh, is a bit different they were actually taking pictures of of the locations where where bridgeton was <laughs> was shot oh. actually i i was being chased by bridgeton i criticized bridgeton and has been chased by well, it you say once, once you go bridgeton you never go exactly back. <laughs> okay, 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Jupe, hold on. Uh, uh, bridges, so you but never go but tell me, uh, did you also not? I'm sure you could not resist this opportunity to also take a picture. Did you take a selfie next to some of the bridges and locations? No, because I don't. I wouldn't know what oh. the locations were because I only watched a few episodes and and it disgusted me. Now at this point, I need to tell our listeners because last time we talked about Bridgeton and I bitched about Bridgeton as I usually do, uh, but I I and. I had a lot of people writing to me on Instagram, in person, lots of people who were livid. Now, we talked about very sensitive topics so far. We talked about very, very controversial topics. 
But but I Bath think, is the, the only one that raised so much concern. No, no, Bridgestone. You know, Sorry, Bridgestone, no, I think Bath. because people were really sad what we told there is no sex. Maybe that was the thing. Maybe no, we, we I, think, really... I think I think the, the problem is is, is another one um uh, with uh, with this, and this allows me mm -hmm. to introduce mm -hmm. another theme, which is what it means to like something, uh, or to like a product. Now people think that when I am criticizing Bath, I am implicitly criticizing people who like uh, sorry bath by felicia ciao bridgerton uh they think that when i'm criticizing bridgerton i'm implicitly criticizing them as well which is absolutely oh, not as british people intention. but hold on no no no, no. Oh. the viewers the viewers, oh, right. so the viewers I... think if you're criticizing Bridgerton, it means you say that I don't have taste, that I'm criticizing their Ooh. taste, but I'm not. I like plenty of nasty things. I like plenty of ugly things. I love Barbie Girl, the song, but I don't think that Barbie Girl is a beautiful song. So liking something should not be conflated with thinking that, that something is beautiful uh, or, or um, enlightening. I think those are two different uh, plans that should never be conflated. Yeah, it would be the same yeah. if you would suddenly say a uh, Prada latest collection would be ugly and I would be like Trippi, do you have an issue with my aesthetic taste? And exactly, yes. Oh. That, so when I am criticizing Bridgerton for very specific reasons, this does not mean that people should not enjoy watching it. I so mean, come on. I'm those are two different plans. Yeah. One is a plan of pleasure, and the plan of pleasure nobody should judge because it's personal, it's individual, it's intimate. Another is the plan of uh, beauty or what one thinks uh, beauty is and 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 the, the two one does not need to uh, validate the other those are two different things i like plenty of things and plenty of products and plenty of people who i don't think are particularly enjoyable and or, or particularly nice and then i find that those things enjoyable nevertheless precisely because i know how to discern between things i mean to be honest ugliness and trash as the biggest entertainment in our life somehow as well. You know, beauty uh, can be really profound. Like I went to see this Raphael exhibition at National Gallery, and I feel like I had a transcendent experience looking at some of his beautiful paintings. Doesn't uh, make, uh, you know, it any different that I can go and watch some trashy TV series. And of course. And but actually, one doesn't cancel an album. Not only, but actually you do need, I believe in your life, you do need some moments of trashiness and some moments of nastiness. Uh, in Bath was so beautiful as a city that I was with somebody and I told to this person, I told to this person, please, uh, now I need to see something ugly. I saw too much beauty. This is, 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 is oppressing me. It's too much. At some point you need to relax and to, and to you know, otherwise beauty Beauty becomes the only thing you know and you are unable to know anything else and even beauty will become your baseline and and, and and you will in order to appreciate beauty sometimes you have to step outside of beauty uh, and therefore you need this contact with things that are not beautiful the only important thing is that you know how to distinguish between the two Definitely. so you should touch on everything and embrace everything but you should know the value of what you are embracing i do like barbie girl but I don't think Papi Girl is beautiful. I know how to discern. Trippi, tell me, when you had this urge to see something ugly, how did you manage to solve it? Where did you go? Uh, it was very easy. Uh, when I reached the... Um, the uh, Pinnacle? St <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the station of Bath, there was a terrible postmodern building made of glass, which I love postmodern architecture, but that one was ugly and it didn't have anything to do with its surroundings. So my my uh, my need for crave. ugliness was my crave for ugliness was satisfied. Uh, isn't it nice to have all spectrum of our craves being satisfied? And I feel like London is also a place where whatever you crave and you will find it, both literally in cuisine sense and in aesthetic taste. Yes, exactly, exactly. But also, like, whoever is ever feeling like we need their ugliness and uncomfort uh, satisfied, we can always tune in and listen to Culture Gone Bad. Oh, yes, 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 exactly. Maybe we can be your ugly escapade or your beautiful escapade. You decide. It depends how I you look at to. it. Depends how you want to look at it, yes. So my point is, if I'm criticizing Bridgerton, don't feel attacked because I'm not attacking 
attacking you as individuals. I am simply talking about what I think of a TV series that I think is very badly put together, uh, which does not mean that you are not entitled to like it. I the, yesterday I watched yesterday and the day before I watched this appalling TV series called Anatomy of a Scandal, which I don't know if you had if you were fortunate enough. To no, watch. I didn't have this fortune. I haven't had a fortune to watch anything uh, lately. I only been looking at Raphael paintings. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Too bad. Uh, so, Drupi, enlighten me. Tell me about the entertainment, which has some actual, you know, so, higher meaning behind yeah, it. Yeah. So the let me take the names of the uh, actors because the actors I think are pretty good, all of them. So Sienna Miller, great, great, great. Uh, compared uh, so to, I mean, had this scandal with walk cover. Remember, where like where we could not photograph him well enough to be put on a walk magazine cover. Remember, it was like when it was documentary about yeah, the September magazine. issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where we were like, she's got too much teeth, like your hair is messy. Yeah, 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 yeah. But she was very good in this uh, in this series. Also, she doesn't play much because she's rich and she doesn't need to work. And then Rupert Friend, and then Naomi Scott, and Michelle Dockery, who, who is the actress uh, that played in the, one of the main characters in Downton um, Abbey. So, uh, and then this, this actress who I didn't know, forgive my ignorance, uh, Josette Simon, um, but she is truly, truly great. She plays a lawyer. So it's the story of a um, politician. I cannot, I don't want to spoil it too much, but essentially the baseline is this. is the story of a politician, coincidentally a conservative, and the guy is a um, allegedly a rapist. So he's this case but the, my problem with the series is that uh, it's potentially interesting and it starts off very well but then it becomes too ideological and as usual things that want to be good end up being ugly because when you put ideology in the middle and you are not concerned with creating a beautiful story but to, with only creating the right story you end up you end up uh, shooting yourself in the balls, as we say in Italy. <laughs> but what do you mean, like, on the right story? Like, what do you think is the biggest problem of it? Okay, the biggest problem is this. Uh, the story is the story of a rapist, and there is this very, uh, on the one hand, very childish division between men who are rapists and bad, especially when they are conservative, because it's impossible to conceive somebody who is conservative and also a nice person. So there is, there is this sort of, the sort of very childish um, division between between good and bad in a way, and then there the women in the the. the, the my problem is that the series was so preoccupied of painting the man as a uh, monster that it forgot to paint women as something that was not either uh, either a, a victim, a survivor of rape. So women are all either survivors of rape or they are stupid and don't really see what happens around them. And for instance, Sienna Miller is the wife of this politician and she's oblivious to, this guy is a monster, but she never noticed it. She's oblivious oblivious to anything and it, it, it ends no up mystery? in a very sorry like, is there no mystery like is it like absolutely yeah yeah there is there is be, yeah like... there is some mystery but uh but it's very uh, everything is very predictable even the end is very cheesy and predictable the, the end feels very rushed and uh i don't know i feel it's like it was it was selling an idea of of toxic masculinity i don't know which idea of femininity this sells to be honest because mm -hmm. uh, uh, as i was saying women are either victims uh, uh and uh, victims victimized and also victims uh and or they are oblivious to whatever happens around them so um nobody's a winner in so this so i think you want this. to talk about it when if you didn't and like didn't feel, did you get any value uh, out I of think, this yes the value is that the actors are very good okay. uh so it's most of the i i didn't so expect those acting. actors to be to be uh, to be the good especially the uh the um the actress uh the uh this uh this lady josette simon who is this mm -hmm. um this this lady who plays a lawyer and she's uh, very good and Sienna Miller surprisingly good as well um, but it's very cheesy the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because this culture gone bad and this is a series gone bad but also it's a major hit on Netflix right now so, oh, wow, wow. so yeah I would be very interesting very interested to see what our listeners um, think about it
Oh yeah. And uh, try to change my mind. Also, when I criticize something, I'm always looking for 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 you to bring some some ideas or some evidence to change my mind. I'm very open to change my mind. But so, do you think uh, potentially when people were asking you about Bridget and so much, maybe that was my intention to get you to see it from a no, different perspective? The, the the reaction I got, uh, which I think is very very contemporary, very Z generation, uh, very millennial Z generation reaction, was don't one one uh, of our uh, listeners who is a lovely a lovely girl uh, who very very funny and lovely and lovely person but she she wrote something she was very offended and she told me don't do Bridgerton like this <gasps> and I was like what does this mean I mean if, if you don't agree with me just uh, give me I'm some alternative me. no 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, not at all. I, I, I just try to change my mind by giving me another point of view or by giving me some pieces of evidence. But it's not that I cannot attack it because, because, because otherwise I would be offending your feelings. This is not an argument. So bring me some evidence. And if you bring me some evidence, maybe you change my mind. I, I don't want to change your mind. I, I want to tell you how I see it. But I am open. If you want to show me that there is some value in it, just bring me a, an idea, some evidence evidence and I challenge her because I think she's thinking of uh, of starting a podcast I challenge her and I said Ooh. okay bring me bring me the, the create a, a, um, an episode in response and that would be very very cool and maybe it will convince me so you know it's the the sort of communication is very precious oh, I think, maybe so. we should invite someone to our podcast yeah, exactly. and, uh, and my good topic you know uh, of our conversation with Obama is a Netflix TV series and maybe we can pick opposing opinions who knows what could be interesting yeah. Which, however i have to be honest with you know, maybe it's me specifically or maybe our culture moving to short tiktok videos or whatever not that i'm consuming tiktok but um, i'm not sure i kind of feel like watching tv series at all lately like i remember there was a moment when i really enjoyed it but currently i'd rather watch something on youtube or maybe watch a documentary or a movie for either aesthetic or mind stimulating purposes but you know it's just my reflection but yeah uh, i always find it very incredible how so much content is produced you're talking about raphael you yes. went to watch raphael I, to see raphael. i went to see raphael at national gallery and frankly i was very skeptical about going and seeing it because you know I think there is a huge consensus about European masters and how Michelangelo, Raphael, I almost thought, what else can you see? Also, National Gallery has a fantastic prominent collection. Is there really a point in pain and dedicating time to just go and see it? But I have to be honest, I have been proven wrong. First of all, they did excellent creating job. And I have huge respect uh, for that. The reason being, lately and maybe that's again my experience i felt a lot of exhibitions in london but curation was giving us moral lessons and very specific yeah. values even before you enter the exhibition where it would be something like um this exhibition is dedicated to this painter who worked in 18th century and we have to acknowledge in 18th century britain was an empire yeah, yeah, yeah. or something like that and i always felt like right so you're not giving me facts you're giving me your perception yeah, yeah, yeah. of this this exhibition, every painting, like the booklet was like as a book, which was quite incredible. I haven't seen such an in-depth and full of information booklet to accompany the exhibition in a long time. But there was no single message which would give any value. It was just a fact. Raphael done that. He grew up in this city. He trained in that school. That was his message. That was a sort of a concept behind this painting. And then it's up to you to decide how you feel about of it. Of course. And that's Which how it should be. Yeah. It was brilliant. It was incredibly important. It's brilliant. Uh, this is what they should be. It's, it's the baseline of, of good. But it's not, not even something. Yeah, but that, I agree with you. But now we are so unused to it. We are so not used to it anymore that we see this approach approach to curation and we think it's genius just because we <laughs> you know what used to be normal yesterday it's becoming yeah. special today the irony of culture gone bad right yeah uh but honestly i thought it was very refreshing to go to an exhibition which was not trying to give me uh you know a lesson on how my cultural views should be framed by contemporary trends yeah ironic right um obviously incredible paintings a lot of them 
traditional Renaissance colors, compositions, and probably this is a huge advantage of London or any big exhibition. Lobos managed to bring some very um, incredible paintings from all over the world. Some of them are private collections. Some of, yeah. There was a huge selection of paintings from Louvre. And uh, I think you probably will be able to tell me a little bit more about Louvre and Paris very soon. But yeah. uh, I've been to Louvre and it's like a torture, you know, full of tourists. You can't really see any painting, flashes everywhere, security, protection screen. It's just like a fucking like shit show. Yeah, I, to, to be honest, I, I have a different perspective on Louvre because I, yeah, because I lived in Paris when I was 20 and I did part of my studies in Paris and I had a um, student's card, so I could uh, access the Louvre for free one day every week. So in the span of six months, I have been to Louvre basically every week. And I dedicated my visit only to one, I think it was the Wednesdays. Uh, Anyway, I dedicated my um, so my visits to a different area of the uh, of the uh, museum. So by the end of the six months, I had I did not have the very rushed, quick experience of visiting Louvre once in your life. By the end of the six months, I had seen every area of the museum and understood each period each section separately so i i have a privileged right but yeah. it's a luxurious yeah yeah yeah, yeah, experience. yeah 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 um right well i've been to louver once and like i said it was nonsense because of all these conditions but i understand if you have time you probably can definitely get a better outcome yeah so therefore i thought from this perspective it was nice that we managed to bring some of uh Marvel's Raphael pieces. Also, uh, some of the paintings were really struck me and I felt like I had this transcendental experience where you look at work of art and you feel completely being taken away from current mm -hmm. reality and being transported into some sort of a connection with whatever artist represented and, and the narrative of a painting, which was beautiful. And they really presented Raphael being a multi-talented uh, artists who work in different areas, um, both paintings, uh, frescoes, architecture, a bit of interior yeah, elements. That's the essence of Renaissance, really. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I always, maybe it was me, but I always considered him to be a painter and uh, the other person I went to knew Raphael work quite well. We also were surprised to see in how many different areas yeah, he yeah. was excellent. It wasn't like he was average, like he was quite good at all of them. I mean, yes, he was, in Italy, uh, we call him uh, the divine painter. Well, I had a divine experience uh, yeah. at National Gallery. So and I think, I think conventionally, the uh, end of Renaissance is the death of Raphael, is considered conventionally speaking the end of Renaissance. And after that, a new period, a new, a new uh, sort of season starts in Italian uh, painting, Italian art, which is mannerism. And mannerism is a sort of uh, a sort of a precious repetition mm -hmm. of whatever Renaissance was, but is without the sparkles of Renaissance, and it is without the fascination with nature of Renaissance. Is a repetition of the paintings that Renaissance. Um, did looking at nature so mannerism is the painting of a painting as opposed to the painting of a of nature yeah and that's why i think mannerism always feels a little bit odd yeah. or almost uncanny yeah i always yeah. felt yeah. exactly uh, mannerism to be quite uncanny like in terms of composition body placement yeah. and narrative and speaking of uncanny droopy guess what I visited Freud Museum in London quite recently. Das Unheimlich, which is also my tattoo. Oh, yes. Uh, I definitely uh, felt there were some uncanny elements in that. Uh, I tell you that, he lived in a very nice house in the end of his life in yeah. London. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's quite easy to get access to the museum. So if you ever feel like you need some... Um, I don't know, uh, therapy support. You can always go you know, and I, imagine yourself having a little chat with Freud, like, where's this room? I, I wrote uh, one bachelor's degree uh, um, dissertation on Freud and one master's degree, my first master on, on my first master's degree on, on Freudian um, theory. Um, and yet I have never been to his house. 
So, uh, which is an amazing place because he used to collect all these Egyptians and Romans yeah. antiques because he was an expert in, in so many fields. So yeah, and I need to go. I, I, agree I actually, like what was a big contemplation I had while being at his house. I found it very confusing in terms of the amount of artifacts he had collected. There was a lot of jade from China. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of little small Egyptian sculptures mm -hmm. and uh, some Arabic uh, art and carpets, yeah. tapestries. And I guess um, the narrative which is presented in the museum, what he was uh, so well educated and always fierce what made him a better psychoanalysis because obviously kind yeah. of saying what there's a historical backup to his knowledge and therefore he can better access the contemporary state of things and human being mind yeah. however I felt this narrative was a little bit far-fetched in terms of giving meaning because someone uh, has collected all this object and decorated his room with that, therefore he is better at this skill. What do you think about no, it? No, 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 no. Freud was an avid collector. Mm -hmm. He wrote uh, papers on art and on also trying to give a psychoanalytic interpretation of things that happened in the past. For instance, the, mm -hmm. his writings about, about the um, Moses by Michelangelo are amazing. He tries to, to, to uh, psychoanalytically uh, understand why the position of this very peculiar sculpture of Michelangelo, what moment of Moses was Michelangelo uh, sculpting. And another, another is the psychoanalytic readings of uh, Leonardo. Um, those are um, unparalleled, beautiful. He tries to understand what is happening uh, in, in a specific painting in which you see little Jesus, little, uh, the cousin of Jesus, um, uh, John the Baptist, I think was, I think it was. And then the, uh, the Mary, the Virgin Mary and the mother of the Virgin Mary, Santan. And he's trying to understand and he links this to some childhood experience of Leonardo that we know because we have records of it. But to, to substantiate what you heard, there are uh, books that Freud writes about uh, anthropology, one of which is a totem and taboo. Uh, now, for Freud, there are two uh, different processes. One is the ontogenetic process and one is the phylogenetic process. So the ontogenetic processes are the uh, processes that every individual experiences in their own personal experience. Mm -hmm. But then you have the phylogenetic processes, which is not the, the history of yourself as an individual, but the history of your species. That's the reason why mm -hmm. Freud looks at the infancy of humanity in totem and taboo, trying to understand how, as humans, we make sense of what is good and bad. And so psychoanalysis is also applied to um, anthropology. And there are many, many books of Freud on anthropology. There are many books on Freud on many essays, not books of Freud on, for instance, a Grecian um, myths. Obviously, the Oedipus complex is nothing but the repetition that we, our modern and bourgeois societies uh, repeat. But the infancy of this is to be found in the very past. So the structures of what Freud... Now, Obviously, some of these ideas are a little bit naive today, but still, there is this great applicability of psychoanalysis, which for Freud could be used to interpret, uh, for instance, anthropology or their cultures, history, art, etc., etc., etc. So I think yeah. there is a kernel of truth in the narrative that you gathered. Interesting. It also made, uh, probably confirmed my bias in a way, but I always saw Freud as someone who managed to have a profound influence on a whole society today. And even though maybe subconsciously, but don't recognize it. Unconscious. Think, <laughs> don't yeah. ever say subconscious. He would be very upset. Oh, unconscious. So, I'm, I'm, I'm utterly sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. He, uh, he, used to, he used to be very upset about these little things, you know. He was very, very... <laughs> um, well, I mean, if I had to pay attention to every single thing I'm upset about, I would be yeah, yeah, I, I would be on that couch covered in probably, Persian carpet. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you know, uh, I thought uh, what is the right way unconsciously. Yes. 
our society is mediated by Freud. All his concepts mm-hmm. really guide everything. And it, it also guides contemporary art, uh, contemporary fiction, fashion, and uh, obviously surrealist, very incredibly inspired by oh, him. Yeah. And surrealism is ever present in everyday experience, really. I think, you know, even myself, I often describe weird experiences to be surreal on Kenny. But that also leads me to uh, this article like you said, uh, Heimlich and Heimlich. And very interesting how actually, I thought that that was a beautiful concept which she says. Things are only disturbing if a way exists sort of uh, in the everyday reality. But Mm -hmm. if we read a fairy tale or some fiction, if some very odd stuff going on, we think it's okay. So essentially the sort of a line where we say something is normal, it's abnormal, is only in a context and i think it's incredibly powerful thought because yeah uh, we all in a way have our own inside idea of what we would perceive to be suitable or unsuitable but it's only only guided by our previous experience yeah really. also there is a concept uh, which is very used in film theory but also i think it applies to a literature as well it does not apply so much to theater but it does apply to other other, uh, creative fields, which is the suspension of disbelief. When you're watching a movie, you are sort of establishing a contract between yourself and the movie, and you suspend your disbelief. You're ready to buy everything that the movie gives you um, Mm. for the duration of the movie. Okay, when when the movie finishes, you know that was impossible, but in the moment, you are ready to buy everything as true. And this happens in movies. It doesn't really happen in in uh, in uh, theater. For instance, if you look at the, if you watch a movie and there is a scene in which at some point uh, I don't know um, there is an editing cut and it goes to uh, one day after, uh, you you know that you you assume that things happen between the day and the day after of the character. Right, but in theater, when the actor goes outside of the stage, you don't assume that his life is carrying on. Uh, you know that this is a play. You have this sort of phony um, idea of actors playing always before your eyes. Whereas in films, you really suspend your disbelief, and this is what the uncanny requires. The uncanny, uh, if you if you are outside of a fiction, if you are outside of a story, that's when it becomes uncanny. Whereas when when you are buying into the the uh, the um, the uh, sort of story, fairy tale, etc., you buy it as true because uh, because and also you suspend not only your disbelief but you also suspend your uncanny uh, feelings. You buy it as something that okay. He gives the example of the of the um, uh, Sandman. Yeah. Yeah. No, true, true. Uh, speaking of other uncanny discoveries we've made recently, we came across this website, uh, Shanzai Lyrics, which analyzes counterfeit market and sort of this fake products and logos and misspelled logos and products which are everywhere in the market. And I thought it was very interesting body of work, which we have managed to create because obviously a lot of counterfeit market is produced in China and uh, how we discovered what some of it is man manipulated mm-hmm. like when we say I don't know Chanel but it would be Canal something yeah, like that yeah. but also sometimes it's machinery manipulated and it's sort of you know man-made like cyborg sort of uh, slash man machine uh, manipulation I thought it was very ironic and funny but you know what it made me really think as well how um the things which are written on clothes, they exist in this dynamic, which is on one hand, you can express status. Like if you buy Gucci t-shirt, you kind of say, right, look at me, I identify with Gucci and I can afford to pay 600 pounds for this t-shirt. However, if you suddenly uh, buy a t-shirt which says cutie in Gucci font, uh, you probably think, oh, people will know I'm smart, I'm beyond being identified with a brand because I have a personality or something like that. But then I thought, but what happens when you say, when you buy a t-shirt Gucci, are you even aware of it's like, you know, some sort of uh, made up 
um, a product which has been, you know, counterfeited somewhere in China and you just thought it was cute or it reminded you of something? Or do you think you're actually, again, exercising some self-irony? I think that kept on thinking, like, you know, inspiring my thoughts to also be still reflect on what that month in Balenciaga did with their success over the past 10 years, because I think a lot of younger generations really buy this irony. But simultaneously, I also reflected on how many people, even in London, wear different t-shirts, which says, I don't know, rebel or be happy. And it's also very common for people to wear t-shirts which say Miami or Paris or um, Saint-Tropez or wherever. But I thought very little people in London uh, wear t-shirts, unless it's part of a merchandise which says London. However, if you go to Russia or Paris or to even like some in States, a lot of people are wearing t-shirts which just say in London. So I thought uh, writing on clothes also is an opportunity to project ourselves to some sort of aspirational places of or sort of experiences we would like to identify with. But uh, it's verily what we want to identify with a place we're currently at. It's always about aspiration. It's almost like advertising in a way or projecting. And I thought that's a very powerful tool. And that's why this market for personalization exists. You know, you can go and get, go to Nike and you can, you know, write, I don't know, uh, Alexandra and Drupi, London 2022, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And suddenly it makes it feel very special, even though it's nothing by a piece of plastic on your t-shirt. It's quite incredible how yeah. powerful language is. And it made me also think about Roland Barthes and how he said, you know, uh, fashion on this level is one thing but fashion and writing yeah, creates a yeah, very yeah, yeah. specific notion of how yeah, we experience yeah, our yeah, world yeah yeah absolutely yeah i think the i don't know if roland Barthes would rewrite that book in the same way the language of fashion because because at the time fashion magazines were really read by people i don't think people read fashion it was very forced narrative but it was like this oh yeah dress. absolutely it was absolutely. so romanticized yeah but um, because people used to write to read them now mm -hmm. even if you romanticize nobody's gonna now it's all uh saying that the brands the few articles that you read is about how amazing brands are but there is no and creative you know, yeah, genius yeah, yeah, yeah. And creative geniuses yes 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 so yeah no no uh, you absolutely uh, right I, I find it interesting how brands try to convince you that you can personalize things in other words they are still saying you have to buy me but i'll make you believe that you are buying something that is not uh, a mass produce but it is only yours yeah and um yeah this uh, it really caters to the uh to, to the uniqueness. Uh, recently, I came across a theory that I'm going to use in, in some uh, of the, my papers on fashion because it's very beautiful. I was studying conformity in, uh, in humans, how humans conform. And at some point, a scientist, after making a lot of experiments on, on trying to see how people conform, proposed an idea that conformity is the only way. There is no such a thing as not being conformists. And that is because if you are an, uh, a non-conformer, that's how he calls them, uh, you are just marching at the beat of a more distant drum. But essentially, you're always marching at somebody's uh, drum. Okay, so the true independence is not possible in humans, because very often when you think you're being independent, for instance, in fashion and dressing in an alternative way, you're always creating your alternative way by uh, following an alternative idea of, um, of, uh, of something. In other words, even your non-conformity is driven by conformity. You, you are enslaved by the same processes that, uh, that inform conformity. Your attempts to exit conformity are still regulated by the same processes. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, I think, you know, we all are victims of our own uh, ways of escape in a way, because, you know, the moment we start to 
believe or identify with something strongly, even though we think it's different from everyone else, we in a way become absolutely absorbed by it simultaneously, mm-hmm. you know, the irony of uh, belonging and being excluded, yeah, you know, constant indeed. dilemma. But you tell me, have you ever bought any t-shirt which had branding on it or any sort of a slogan, or have you ever personalized the t-shirt? Uh, and no, because I'm not a big slogan person and because I'm not a, um, uh, yeah, no, um, probably be, I have a, a t-shirt which says Berlin, but I was not looking for it. I was not making a statement. I just bought it because I like the, how it fit, how I looked in it. <laughs> um, maybe you were planning to go to Bergheim eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Usually, I prefer t- plain T-shirts with no uh, with no um, meaning written, <laughs> possibly with no meaning, except uh, and nothing written on it unless it's Prada. I mean, come on, you have enough of writings on your body. As it exactly, is. exactly. Probably that's why. Um, no, quite interesting. But I'm always very curious when I see writings on clothing and what we mean. And, uh, you know, it's like mini rebellion, especially when people say like disobey or destroy, like yeah, yeah, little, yeah, yeah. but uh, obviously like always my own, like that uh, channel or this platform, which I found, I think the most exciting thing about the Shanzai lyrics is what they found this uh, specific example of going by the serious typos. And then like when this type is secure, I, I always wonder, whoever bought this t-shirt did we even notice that where is the typo and did are we wearing it on yeah. purpose or it's just an accident and we never even acknowledge we just bought because the t-shirt fit or color was lovely or it wasn't a discount also there is uh, there is a very a notorious lack of irony of the world of fashion the only now is uh, fashion is reappropriating irony because it's in the spirit of of the of postmodernity, but traditionally fashion is not very ironic. It's very unironic and serious. You know, the 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 the, the resting bitch face of the models says it all. Zulander understood it very very soon. But the only probably example of somebody who was clearly ironic in a funny way, not ironic in a serious way like Schiaparelli, but ironic in a funny way was Franco Moschino uh, in the eighties and early nineties. He was the one who was making fun of every brand and he made fun of especially luxury brands especially chanel and chanel sued moschino very often that he would create this these chanel bags uh, with the quilted chanel bags in, with moschino logos instead or he would write moschino couture with a with a with a, an exclamation mark but moschino couture for a ready to wear line so making fun of couture itself or he would put two um two interlocking uh, question marks like the two interlocking Chanel logos and he would get constantly sued by the brands for this operation of making fun of luxury Mm, fashion. Almost like Dapper Dan in the 80s and when he became that. Yeah, the the, 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 fun, the fact that I found always particular about Moschino and interesting is that Moschino did what these uh, Chinese copies are doing, mm-hmm. except minus the quality, because Moschino's quality, even though it was Pret-a-Porte, was always great quality. So he was mocking the brands from an aesthetic point of view, but clearly in a phony and, and, and ironic way, because the quality was good. So you would, it's not like those brands that put a fake name of some brand because they are trying to make up for the lack of quality. Moschino is actually selling something good quality, but still taking the piece out of big brands. Mm, quite interesting. I also want to see another exhibition at Royal Academy about Japanese artists. Uh, mm-hmm. I might mispronounce it with all my, you know, cultural oblivion, but I think it's Kiyosai. And... Uh, it's- Kiyosai, the name of an artist. Kiyosai. And he would do this sort of a woodblock prints, you know, the typical sort of Japanese art yeah. aesthetic looking. But the reason why I want to talk about it, he would paint a lot uh, while after drinking a whole bottle of sake. Mm. So very drunk. And I found <laughs> uh, it really influenced his style. You could, there was no consistency. Like a whole style is always a place. But there was a lot of satire, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, this technique in art where he displays animals like humans. He would have frogs playing games or maybe um, 
uh, ravens, the picketers, politicians. So it was a lot of political satire and a lot of irony about, you know, human sort of greed or low moral standards in the end of the day. Well, it's what we all about, low moral standards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, Jupe, I think uh, what made me think and what I wanted to ask you, uh, so was, where was some narrative, an exhibition guide, which said what potentially, because he was drinking so much, he thought it would loosen up his brush and would enable him to express more creatively. So do you buy the narrative, what sometimes intoxication uh, enables artists to be even more flamboyant and expressive rather than being sober and focused? No. I think this is an attempt of uh, glorifying and dignifying uh, substance abuse. And I think we are, we reached a point in our society, we are mature enough to say, I abuse of substances if I want to, just because it's my freedom to do so, not because it enhances me as a person. Uh, and I think those are all attempts of uh, so, sort of big generation, uh, all attempts at glorifying and giving meaning to, um, yeah, to, to something that does not require to be justified, really. Do it if you want to do it, but don't convince me. Because I can also make the case for the opposite idea. If you're not a good artist on your own, then it means you're not a good artist. So yeah. it's one can make any case. That's what I'm trying to say. At the end of the day, it does not really matter how you get to the point. It matters what you leave. And, 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 and the painting you leave behind, the, po the poem or the book you leave behind, I don't care how you produced it. I care about what it says on its own. The uh, artworks should communicate regardless of the condition and the person who wrote them. And the condition in which they were written. And the moment brush was falling out and everything was double vision does not concern us because after all we are there to appreciate the art. Yeah. But it's quite interesting. He had some art uh, where he would uh, draw like a massive frog drinking a huge bottle of sake. He he almost like fetishized the idea of alcohol, which I thought was very. Uh, interesting but also very questionable and ambiguous yeah but at the, at the end of the day you, you liked it because the paintings were good who cares about the fact that he produced them under the influence or not um, I just thought it was very interesting uh, idea of creativity. Do substances and any sort of altered uh, state of minds are they enhance the creativity of human beings, or they actually just give us an illusion that it's enhanced? I think that, that mm -hmm. was my sort of uh, yeah. But it's one of those things that if it was if the if 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 it was possible to give an answer to this, then we would only have great artists under the influence of things. Um, if it was so easy to say, they increase, because it's plenty, that, uh, let's be honest, I know a lot of people who take uh, uh, drugs and alcohol and they are not able to create anything good. So I don't think it's, it's that easy to say it in, improves your abilities. Uh, it may do, it may not, maybe that's not the defining uh, factor. Uh, but also also, I am an extremely, as you know, I'm an extremely rational person, and my only drug is, is being on control, in control of myself, and that is probably not necessarily always a good thing. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully, um, you know, there are um, good things about being in control, and but also, you know, if there is no bad artist, culture gone bad, wouldn't have anything that's, to reflect on. That's so, true. Regardless so we encourage everybody to <laughs> we encourage everyone to, <laughs> to drink <you> know, <laughs> drink uh, go into altered state of minds and then we will look at what you produce and uh we will share some criticism or admiration depending on how far you go and uh, until until next time we'll share more uh, culturally bad stuff with you